Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on A Beginner's Guide to Bankruptcy and the new Subchapter 5. I'm Bob Hogan, the webinar coordinator today and the business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'm going to be your host, and our presenter is Cliff Enico. Uh, more on Cliff in just a minute, uh, but first some brief information on SCORE. Uh, SCORE is a national organization with over 11,000 volunteers across the country. And locally here in Score Fairfield County, we have over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. And uh, Score offers three primary value added services to small business owners. Uh, first of all, we offer free one on one counseling that can be face to face, telephone, or email. But in today's environment, the face to face is replaced by Zoom video. Um, and you can access that counseling uh, via the request a mentor link on our website or using the link that you see on the screen there for one on one mentoring. We also provide um, a wide range of educational workshops and webinars and it's uh, primarily webinars in this uh, post COVID-19 environment and over 150 uh, throughout the year. And lastly, we offer extensive resources on our website, including access to a network of subject matter experts. Our next live webinar will be this Thursday, May 28th at 8 a.m. And the topic is balancing the technology of work and homeschooling with Bud Freud planning. And you can find more specifics on that on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org. You'll also find on our website a large number of archived webinars that uh, contain a wide range of business topics um, that may be of interest to you. So we'd encourage you to go to our archived webinars. Uh, some information about today's event, as um, we put in the chat feature there, um, the webinar is being recorded, and so you will be able to access that within, the, uh, within about 48 hours. We've also set aside time for questions and answers uh, at the end of the presentation, but you can uh, submit a question at any time by just um, clicking on the chat feature uh, below on the screen and uh, submitting your question, and then Cliff will take it at the end. Uh, we will end the webinar sharply at one o'clock to respect your time. And as I said, it will be recorded. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, which is, uh, who is Cliff Amico. Uh, Cliff is a nationally recognized small business legal and tax expert, and is best known as the former host of Money Hunt on PBS, where entrepreneurs defended their business plans before America's toughest panel of experts. An attorney and a small business consultant based in Fairfield, Connecticut, Cliff has helped launch over 15,000 businesses. He's the author of 16 books, the most recent one being the crowdfunding handbook, How to Raise Capital for Your Business Using Equity Funding Portals. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Cliff. Cliff, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Elliot, very much. And, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking uh, time out from uh, your no doubt busy schedules to uh, listen to a program that isn't perhaps the most fun program that I do for SCORE. I'll be very honest with you. I do quite a few programs for SCORE each year. And this is a topic that uh, isn't one of the fun ones to talk about. Uh, the very fact that you are attending a program on this topic means that things are probably not going very well in your world right now. And all I can say there is welcome to the club. Uh, the last couple of months, all I have been doing in my uh, law practice is advise clients, mostly retail clients, on how to renegotiate their leases, how to deal with their creditors, how to deal with their with their lenders and stuff. You know, because of the pandemic shutdowns. Uh, if you are listening to this program, you are probably very much affected by that, and this program is for you. Um, before we begin, uh, we always have a few disclaimers. If you ever doubted that I am a lawyer by training, uh, this, will, this will prove it. Uh, we always tell you what we're not going to do before we tell you what we are going to do. Um, the most important one is the second one. Uh, there is a very big difference between giving out legal information and being giving legal advice. Now, obviously, we're talking about bankruptcy, which is a legal topic uh, today. Uh, and I will certainly do what I can to answer uh, as many of your questions as possible. Um, but th there's a very big difference between saying this is what the law is all about, and this is what you, Joe, should do, and this is why you, Elliot, should do something different. Um, you know, that, that, that's advice. And I really don't know any of you well enough to be 
able to give you one-on-one -on -one advice. I, I just don't know you well enough to do that. So if you hear something on this program that sounds like a great idea and you do it and it doesn't work and you do end up going into bankruptcy uh, and you know you lose everything, you lose your house, your spouse divorces you, the kids hate you, they want to talk to you anymore, the dog pees on your leg and you end up living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge, you can't sue anybody, okay? That's what this disclaimer basically says. So things are not going well. Should you call it quits? In the, in the words of a punk rock song of the late 80s, do, you, do I stay or do I go? Um, a lot of people are asking this question. Um, I always t like to begin by telling my clients, you know, first of all, when, whenever you find yourself in a hole, in a financial hole, the first thing you got to do is stop digging. Don't make it worse. Uh, don't incur any new debts or, or engage in any new borrowing until you know, uh, unless it is something that you absolutely have to have. Um, what a lot of people are doing and what I tell my clients to do who are in debt is get all your debts in one place and perform triage. This is how you survive over the short term. You, divide, you, you take your debts, your bills, and you divide them into three piles. Pile number one are the essential bills. These are the, bill, these are the things that you need to stay in business. So if you are a uh, liquor store or a, or, or a bar, for example, your liquor supplier is a, key, uh, is, a key, is a key vendor, a key creditor. That person has to get paid on time. If your supply of liquor drives up, you're, drives up you are out of business permanently. Uh, so, so it's Essential bills get paid now. Um, you know, maybe after a little bit of negotiation, but you, but those are the people who get paid currently. Uh, the second pile are people who are not essential, but they're yelling, screaming, and cursing so loud that you just want to get them out of your life. Uh, that's a very real part of this process, by the way. Uh, a lot of creditors do this. They know that they are, they're not an essential service, but they still want to get paid on time. So they make your life so miserable that you pay them just to get rid of them. Um, you know, and you may just want to do that. And then the pile number three is everybody else and everybody else waits basically until you are able to pay those debts on time. Maybe you talk to them, maybe you don't. Uh, hopefully they're mostly smaller debts, but these are the three piles that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So should you file for bankruptcy or should you not? Okay, the first thing you need to do is make a list of all your creditors and how much you owe each of them. And not all creditors are equal. You need to, to divide them into various piles or various flavors of debt, as, is what I call it here. So for example, is a particular debt secured or unsecured? A secured debt means that the, the creditor has a lien on your business assets. We call it a UCC lien. It stands for Uniform Commercial Code. If you go to the Secretary of State's office uh, in your state and you search for UCC records, uh, you usually can do a search under your business name and find out if anybody has a UCC lien on any of your assets. If you have a bank loan, an SBA loan, you almost certainly have a UCC lien in favor of of that lender. Sometimes creditors place UCC liens on your property and they don't tell you about that. They're not supposed to do that, um, but you know, uh, but they may be able to get away with that if, uh, if, if, they, if you owe somebody long enough and especially if they have warned you in advance they're going to do that. They may put a lien on your property. So make a pile of the secured liens. Everybody else is an unsecured lien. If they do not have a UCC lien recorded with the Secretary of State's office, then they are an unsecured creditor, which means that they have no collateral for their loan. Or, or their debt. Um, you know, institutional versus individual is who is the creditor? It matters. If the creditor is an institution like a bank or a commercial landlord, a commercial realtor, um, you know, individuals can be emotional. Uh, institutional creditors are not emotional. They're business people. They don't get caught up in emotion. For them, this is a business decision, a cost benefit analysis as to whether or not to you know, give you more time to pay your debts, work things out with you or whatever. Individuals can get emotional and the closer they are to you, the more emotional they're going to be. If you have borrowed money from Aunt Irma to run your business, Aunt Irma cannot be counted on to look at this as, as a business decision and an economic decision. You can't talk to her rationally the way you 
can an institutional creditor. How much of your debt is owned by institutional people and how many people, how much of your debt is owned by individuals? Debt you have personally guaranteed. This is very important. If you have an LLC or a corporation and that entity owes debt, um, have you personally guaranteed that with your personal assets? If you have a business credit card, like an Amex card or a Visa card, you, if you look at the credit card, you'll probably see it has both your business name and your individual name. Whenever you apply for a credit card as a, um, uh, a bank credit card as an LLC or corporation, uh, the credit card company looks to you as the guarantor of that debt. You have personally guaranteed that debt. Um, if, if you have a lease with a landlord, did you sign a personal guarantee or did just the LLC or corporation sign the lease? That's something you want to look at today, first thing, uh, especially if you have a, a retail business where you've leased commercial space. Last but not least, who are the sane people and who are the crazy people? Who are the people who are yelling and screaming and cursing and dropping the F-bomb? And who are the people who are easier to deal with? That's these are the, This is the information you need to collect before you can figure out what your strategy is going to be. Uh, then the next thing you need to do is to project your cash flow over the next six to 12 months as best you can. And this is extremely difficult right now because of the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we nobody really knows what their revenue is going to be like over the next six to 12 months, especially now that we are starting to reopen the economy. Certain businesses are being allowed to function, but under new rules. Uh, you know, if you run a bar, for example, you're going to have to do social distancing and you're going to have to put up plastic screens behind the bar, in front of the bartenders and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have additional costs. Um, you know, it's very difficult to do. What I am telling my clients to do is to look at what their revenue was last year at this same time and budget 30 to 50% of that for the next uh, six to 12 months. Now that's probably overly conservative. It probably is, uh, but you want to do a worst case projection here. Underestimate your revenue and overestimate your costs when you're in a situation like this. Uh, and here are the questions you need to ask. Will you be able to cover your essential operating expenses, the pile number one, the essential creditors who must be paid on time or else you dry up and you die, uh, and also your existing debt service, your monthly payments to your landlord, whatever. Can you do that within, for the next six to 12 months without borrowing any, any additional funds? And if the answer is no, you can't, do your best effort, make a best, make, do your best effort to figure out how long it is going to take. Is it going to take two years, three years, five years uh, to get out of the hole. Uh, do some, some basic number crunching on a spreadsheet and ask yourself, assuming 30 to 50% of last year's revenue over the next six to 12 months, how long is it going to take? Can you pay your essential ex operating expenses and your monthly debt service and pay everybody else who's not in that pile, the piles two and three people over the next six, 12, 18, 24 months? How long is it going to take that? You need that information. Then do a liquidation analysis. Now, this is a balance sheet test. The cash flow is an income statement thing. The liquidation analysis is a balance sheet thing. Uh, you know, total up all your debt, um, secured and unsecured, and then calculate, then figure out what all your business assets are worth. If you were to sell them all today for roughly their fair market value, how much of your debt could you pay off? How much of that? You want to know that information. Not that you're going to do it, but this is called a liquidation analysis, and it's the key factor in determining whether or not you do a liquidation or a reorganization in bankruptcy. And then last but not least, and this is all the financial stuff we've been talking about, do an emotional analysis too. I call it a burnout self-assessment. I mean, are you fed up with this business? Are you willing to stick with this business and, and work for the benefit of your creditors for the next year, two years, three years, however long it takes to get out of the hole? Are you willing to do it, or are you just so burnt? out that you just want to throw up your hands, retire to Florida and work at a beachfront bar or something like that. Uh, believe me, the temptation has occurred to me over the last few months. You would not be crazy if you've been thinking about stuff like that. Do, do a self-analysis too. I mean, can you do it? I mean, even if you can financially pay your creditors over the next three to five years, are you willing to stay in business, you know, for, for their benefit for that period of time?
Uh, here are some rules of thumb. So should you liquidate? Should you reorganize? I mean, there are no magic ratios here. Um, I mean, I, I wrestled with this. I mean, is there, you know, people are, I'm probably going to ask me at some point, Cliff, are there any real magic ratios? Is it, you know, two times, if your debt is two times revenue, should you liquidate? If it's, you know, three times revenue, you know, should you do something? There's no magic ratios here. I mean, banks love ratios. They do. If you have a bank loan, you know that half the loan documents consist of, of coverage ratios of various types. But here, to me, are the more realistic things you need to think about. Let's say you are burned out. You, you just do not want to run this business anymore. You want to go. You want to exit gracefully. Um, if you can afford to pay all your debt by liquidating your business assets, this is the liquidation analysis we talked about on the last slide. If you could sell all your assets today and pay everybody, then that is what you should do. And you should do it outside of the bankruptcy court, because bankruptcy is very expensive. Uh, a Second scenario is, which is not on the slide, if you are burned out and if you were to liquidate all your assets today, if you have an LLC or corporation and you are burned out and you wouldn't be able to pay all your creditors by filing, by, by liquidating your business, but you would be able to pay all the debt that you personally guaranteed then it is worth it to do so outside of bankruptcy. Um, it is worth it to do, even though everybody's not being paid out, unless, unless you have personally guaranteed the debt, your creditor can only go after your LLC or your corporation. They can't go after your personal assets. So it may make sense for you to liquidate outside of bankruptcy in that scenario as well. Um, if you have a, only a few creditors, a manageable handful of creditors, and they are relatively sane, they're sophisticated, they're emotional. They look at this as a business situation. Um, you know, they're not going to get personal with you. Try to negotiate a workout outside of bankruptcy. We'll talk about workouts in a couple of minutes. Uh, the more creditors you have, the harder it is to reorganize in bankruptcy. If you only have a few manageable creditors, try to negotiate a workout. But if you have lots of creditors and they're both, they're all over the place, they're both sane and otherwise, you have lots of people in all three piles uh, in the triage, um, and, but you think you can pay them all from your projected disposable income, your free cash flow over the next three to five years. And those dates are important. That time frame is important. Consider reorganizing under the new subchapter five, which we're going to talk about later. Um, if you have many creditors, but there's, and there's no way you can pay them for disposable income for the foreseeable future, and you haven't personally guaranteed any debt. Or um, if you did liquidate, uh, you could pay all the personal guaranteed debt. Uh, consider liquidating under Chapter 7 of the Bankruptcy Code. Uh, and then last but not least, if you have many creditors and you have personally guaranteed a lot of it and you can't pay all of the personally guaranteed debt by liquidating, you may have to file for personal bankruptcy as well. You won't be able to get away with just putting your LLC or corporation into bankruptcy. Uh, I want to just take a second. If you are in a situation where you owe lots of people lots of money, you're probably sooner or later, you are going to be getting a demand letter from the credit insisting upon payment. Uh, these are required by law in virtually every state. Debtors are not allowed to collect their debts unless they make a formal demand for payment. Uh, you know, you know what the letter looks like. It says, you know, you, you jerk, you owe us money, please pay. If you don't respond within 10 days, we're going to beat you up with baseball bats. Uh, you know what the letter is. Um, generally speaking, if the letter is written by the creditor's attorney on their letterhead, it's more serious. Uh, it means that the creditor has lawyered up and they are paying their lawyer uh, uh, the privilege for the privilege of sending this letter. Uh, they are more serious about enforcing it. The letter is just from the creditor itself. Maybe they're serious, maybe they're not. Uh, but if it comes from an, a legal letterhead from a, from a law firm, that is something you probably should address sooner rather than later. That's a pile two situation that you want to address now. Uh, read the language carefully. Uh, does the letter say, you know, if you don't respond in 10 days, we will sue you. We will commence a court proceeding in superior court. That's a serious thing. If they just say, however, uh, if you don't respond within 10 days, we will have no choice but to explore all of our options, yada, yada. That's less serious language. That's not a commitment. It means you probably, they're inviting you to come to the table and try to negotiate something in that case. They really don't want to go to court when they use language like that. But if the letter says, we are going to sue you in, on day 11, if you don't respond in 10 days, you got to take that seriously. Uh, also keep in mind um, that in virtually every state, a creditor can 
not claim interest going backwards. Uh, so let's say you have a debt, let's say it's an unsecured debt to a vendor. Uh, there's no interest involved at all, uh, but the debtor, the creditor sends you a letter saying, just so you know, from now going forward, I'm gonna charge you interest on 12% per annum on your overdue debt. They can do that. What they cannot do is go back and say, and by the way, you've owed us 12% since the day you initially incurred the debt. They cannot go retroactive on that. Uh, that violates the state usury laws. They cannot do that. They can, however, charge interest prospectively going forward from the date they send their demand letter. In fact, the main purpose of writing you the letter is probably to get to the point where they can start charging you interest. That's why they're sending you the letter, because they didn't do that in their original invoice, uh, their original uh, claim. Okay, collection agencies. There are two things you need to know about collection agencies if you're being harassed by them. Uh, they First of all, they cannot legally collect a debt that is disputed. So if you are being uh, getting hit from calls and letters from collection agencies and you have a valid defense uh, to that debt, you know, the person didn't deliver on time, the thing arrived broken, yada, yada, make that claim. Don't ignore the letter. Call the credit, uh, credit uh, the uh, collection agency and say, this is a disputed debt. Once they know that a debt is disputed, they must stand down by law. They must do that. They are only, collection agencies can only pursue a valid debt. So if the minute you raise a question about the validity of the debt, they throw you back to the uh, creditor, the person you owe the money to, and you deal with them. The second thing you need to know about collection agencies, we all know about the Federal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. It's a federal law. That's the law that says the creditors cannot call you at midnight or two in the morning and, and scare your kids by threatening to send you to jail if you don't pay your debts on time. There's all kinds of stuff that you cannot legally do. The thing you need to know, though, is it only applies to consumer debt. It does not apply to business debtors at all, even a single member LLC. So if you are a single member LLC and you owe tons of money and collection agencies are calling you at three in the morning, I hate to say it, they have every right to do that because you are not considered a consumer, a consumer for purposes of that statute. Okay, let's talk about some alternatives to bankruptcy filing first. Uh, we'll go through this very quickly out of court workouts. You only have a couple of creditors and they're very rational people. Best way to go is to try to work something out with them. Uh, you know, uh, make them an offer to either reduce their debt or to pay it out over a longer period of time. A lot of my clients are doing this now with their landlords, with their franchisors, uh, with I've been business creditors that are rational people. Uh, it's much cheaper than bankruptcy. There's no stigma to it. It doesn't affect your credit rating at all. The only difficulty is it only it only works if the creditor agrees. This is not something you can force down their throats. You have to reach an agreement, a settlement agreement with them, which includes a release of, uh, of liability. Make sure whenever you settle with one of your creditors, have an attorney draft a short agreement. It's called a settlement agreement. It says that how, what the new deal is gonna be, how much you're gonna pay over what period of time, and make sure it includes mutual release language where the creditor releases you and you release them from any existing claim. Once you do that, that they can't come after you. The past is, is just a goodbye, to quote Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Uh, it, it, it's gone, but you must make sure the release language, if there's no release language in the settlement agreement, the creditor has not released its claim against you, and they can still proceed in court if they want to. Uh, the other thing you need to know about, about out of short workouts is they may be unwound if the creditors put you in bankruptcy. Your creditors can file a bankruptcy petition against you without your consent if they can achieve a certain percentage. And if they do that, well, first, one of the first things they're going to want to do is they're going to say that this deal that you cut with your bank or whatever is a voidable preference, and they're going to try to unwind that. Uh, so just keep that in mind. If you owe lots of people lots of money, and you're planning to file in bankruptcy anyway, doing an out-of-court settlement with one of your creditors may not work over the long term. If you have a corporation or LLC, uh, and you want to avoid filing in bankruptcy, you can dissolve the corporation uh, or LLC under state law. The bankruptcy code does not apply to this at all. This is a proceeding under state law. Uh, there are two types. You can either voluntarily dissolve your company. Uh, the owners of the company, the shareholders of a corporation, members of an LLC, agree to dissolve. They file articles of dissolution with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, this works in situations where you owe money to people, you can pay off most of it, and none of the debt is personally guaranteed by the corporation or LLC. Uh, the creditors must look to the corporation or LLC's assets 
assets for their relief. Uh, that's when voluntary dissolution works. Uh, judicial dissolution is another type of dissolution. This is where the owners petition the court to dissolve the corporation or LLC, uh, and the court basically supervises the liquidation of the company. Dissolution is liquidation. It means you're going out of business. Uh, there are three steps to the process. Dissolution means you stop any ongoing business activity. You don't take on any new contracts. You don't service any new customers. You close your doors. Uh, winding up is the completion of existing business. If you're a contractor and you're working on two different houses at the time you dissolve, you can finish those jobs. You just cannot take on a third job at that point. And then liquidation, you take all the existing assets of the company, reduce them to cash, and you distribute them first to creditors. And then if there's anything left over, the owners of the company would share it uh, pro rata based on their percentage ownership of the company. Now, creditors who aren't paid in full have no recourse except they may try to pierce the corporate veil and go after the owner's personal assets. This is very difficult to do though. Uh, most states have created very high barriers to this. They don't like creditors doing this. The only way that they'll be able to do that is if they can show that your corporation or LLC was a fraud in some way. You didn't really respect the corporation or LLC structure. You continued doing business in your individual capacity uh, and are now claiming the corporation for the first time because people are suing you. Uh, they might be able to pierce the corporate if they can prove that their debt is really a personal debt of yours, they can go after you personally. There is no release of personal guarantees in a dissolution or liquidation of a corporation. Uh, if you have personally guaranteed your landlord's debt, they can still come after you and go after your house. Also keep in mind that some states, I have New York particularly in mind, uh, impose per personal liability if you dissolve your corporation or LLC and you owe wages and benefits to your employees, some states will allow them to go after uh, the 10 largest shareholders of a corporation or uh, members of an LLC. That's a New York statute. It dates from the Depression. A lot of other states have statutes. They usually date from the 1930s and 40s to protect workers, uh, specifically wage claims. Okay. Last but not least, if you want to stay out of bankruptcy, there's something called the assignment for the benefit of creditors. This is a situation where you have relatively few creditors. You can't pay them all, but everybody is sort of on the same page that this business is not going to survive uh, and it's better off dead than alive. Uh, and they agree to go along with this. Uh, basically what you do is you transfer all of your assets to an assignee. It's usually a bankruptcy lawyer um, or someone who is a financial expert, uh, financially sophisticated, who liquidates the assets in an orderly manner and distributes them to your creditors uh, pro rata, be based on per a percentage of what they owe of your total debt. So if someone owes 10% of uh, your total debt, they would get 10% of each payment from the assignee. The assignee acts as a fiduciary for creditors and they can operate the business pending distribution of assets. So if you wanna get out quickly, this is the way to go. Uh, at pros, advantages, it's less expensive and formal than bankruptcy. Again, no stigma. You get to choose the assignee. That's your call. So you can get somebody on, uh, on the table who's friendly to you. The negatives are you cannot force an assignment of a lease or contract to somebody else without the other party's consent. You cannot cram them down to use a bankruptcy term. There's also no general discharge of debt. Uh, at the end of the day, if all the assignees have not been paid in full, they could still sue your corporation or LLC, or if they can pierce the corporate corporate veil, they can come after you personally. Uh, it only works if everybody cooperates. Out-of-court bankruptcies only work if everybody cooperates and recognizes that they're only going to get a part of what they were initially owed. Uh, if you have problems with that, if you have creditors who are going to be emotional and all, then you're probably looking at bankruptcy. Okay, a couple of, a couple of things, just some bankruptcy basics. Uh, bankruptcy is governed by federal law, Title 11 of the US, uh, of US Code. There are two types of bankruptcy. In liquidation, the debtor is going out of business and liquidates under the court's supervision. It gets a discharge in bankruptcy. So any creditor who doesn't get paid in full in a Chapter 7 uh, proceeding uh, basically is SOL. They can't do anything about that. Their debt is discharged. They cannot pursue it. Uh, in a reorganization proceeding, uh, the debtor restructures their debts under court supervision. The corporation or LLC is going to stay in alive by adopting a plan of reorganization. Um, it's a detailed document that says basically, here's how all of you are going to get paid. Secured creditor number one, here's how you're going to get paid. Secured creditor number two, uh, we want you to cut your debt by $10,000. We want you to do a $10,000 haircut. All the unsecured creditors are going to get 80 cents on the dollar uh, over a period of three to five years. That's what a plan of reorganization looks like. Uh, debtor who don't
don't participate in the plan are crammed down. It's a bankruptcy turn. It means they must, they are forced to accept the terms of the plan of reorganization that you have put together. Uh, keep in mind, a discharge in bankruptcy affects only the entity that files. If you have personally guaranteed a corporate or LLC debt, your creditors can still pursue you personally and you may have to file for personal bankruptcy unless your creditors agree to release you as part of the plan of reorganization. Um, there are four chapters of the bankruptcy code that to talk about here. I'm only going to do this very quickly to give you the broad picture. Chapter seven is the liquidation uh, provision in the uh, bankruptcy code. Uh, if you don't have enough cash flow to cover current operating expenses and require debt service payments to your secured creditors, and or you are involved in lots of litigation, you have a lot of contracts that you've breached and people are threatening to sue you, uh, chapter seven may be the way to go here. Uh, it's less expensive usually than trying to stay alive. Uh, if you are a sole proprietor, or a husband-wife uh, partnership. Uh, you can get a discharge of your debts and you get to keep your house and other exempt property. Uh, the definitions vary from state to state on this. Uh, there's no single definition of exempt property. Uh, you can keep your house, usually you can keep your house, your car, and some personal assets, but only up to your state's exemption amount. So if you have a $3 million house and your state's exemption amount is only $250,000, your Chapter 7 trustee can sell your house, give you $250,000 to buy a new one, and everything else goes to your creditors. They do have the power. Just because your house is considered exempt property doesn't mean you get to keep it if it's overvalued. Uh, chapters 11, 12, and 13 are the reorganization chapters. These are the chapters for businesses that want to stay in business. Uh, we'll talk about chapter 11 in a minute because subchapter 5 is part of that. Chapters, you want to be aware that there's also chapters 12 and 13. These are for reorganization of individual debtors. If you are a sole proprietor or if you are a husband-wife partnership, a partnership whose only members are a, hum, a husband and wife, you may be able to reorganize under chapters 12 and 13. Um, the chapters 12 and 13 are not available for corporations, LLCs, and partnerships with people other than your spouse. Um, chapter 12 applies only to family farmers and commercial fishermen. Um, so that's it. If you're not in one of those two businesses, forget chapter 12. One of the big questions that I wrestled with in putting together this presentation is, are you better off, if you are an individual, a sole proprietor or a husband-wife partnership, are you better off uh, reorganizing under ch subchapter 5 or chapter 13? Uh, and I really can't come out with a good a good analysis on this, you're going to need to talk to your lawyer. One of your questions you should ask your lawyer if you are such a business is, am I better off reorganizing under chapter 13 or subchapter 5? I strongly suspect the answer is going to be you're better off in subchapter 5, but I'm not enough of a bankruptcy lawyer to be, to ask that question. That is a question you want to ask if you are an in a sole proprietorship or a husband-wife partnership. Okay, so now let's talk about chapter 11. Subchapter 5 is part of chapter 11, so you kind of have to have the big picture. What chapter 11 does, it buys you lots of time to operate. The minute you file chapter 11, something called the automatic stay comes into place which bars your creditors from pursuing any claims that they may have started against you. Everything just freezes and they can't do anything until while the bankruptcy uh, proceeding is wending its way through court. Uh, you are in control of your management and assets of your company. You can continue to operate just like you did before you filed for bankruptcy, um, you know, subject to the court's approval from time to time. But basically, you don't have to have a trustee appointed for you, as it would be the case in Chapter 7. Um, the, you can, if you have burdensome leases or other contracts like union contracts, franchise agreements that you can't pay on time, you can either reject them or you can, you can, you can force your creditor to renegotiate. Uh, you can set aside preferences and fraudulent transfers. You know, if someone got money from you unlawfully within two years prior to your bankruptcy filing, you can actually claw that, that debt back uh, and, 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 and basically treat it as if it never happened. It basically gives you a lot of power. Uh, here. And also the best part is once your plan of reorganization is approved, any creditor who does not sign on to the plan is crammed down. Um, the court can force them to accept their terms and they can't do anything about it. But there are negatives to applying to for filing under chapter 11. People are nervous about doing business with bankrupt companies. They are much more likely to insist on, you know, that you pay them up front or advance payments. 
um, you know, than they did before. You're not living in Kansas anymore. You're not going to be able to continue doing business with people the way you used to. Um, a certain percentage of your creditors can file an involuntary bankruptcy petition against you. Some people can force you into Chapter 11, or if you file for Chapter 11, but a certain percentage of your creditors believe the business cannot be saved, they can force the court to convert it to your proceeding to a Chapter 7 liquidation without your consent. They have that power. Uh, while the bankruptcy proceeding is, uh, is in progress, you will probably be prohibited or restricted from paying your officers and directors salaries. Your employees, will, your W-2 employees will still be paid on time, but you may not be able to pay yourself while the 11 proceeding is in, uh, is in progress. Payments also, you will not be able to pay dividends or any kind of distributions of profit to your shareholders or LLC members. Creditors have an absolute priority to that money. Anything that's not necessary to pay operating expenses and basic debt service, they get basically in, in most reorganization plans. It's very expensive. Uh, the typical uh, you know, chapter 11 proceeding can easily run you 50,000 in attorneys and accountants fees alone. And it is time consuming. They very often take years. Uh, to resolve. Here's just a little uh, a timeline of how the procedure works. Keep in mind that at each stage in the process, the court does have the ability to extend time frames, and they frequently do uh, because they want to give the debtor the maximum chance of reorganizing. Uh, so bankrupt chapter 11 proceedings tend to go on and on for years sometimes. Um, now let's start talking about chapter five. This is why all of you are here, and I want to give this the time that it deserves. Basically, chapter 11 is, is, the, is, the, is the main uh, provision of the bankruptcy code for business reorganizations. Um, back in last year, last August of 2019, Congress passed the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019, which became effective in February of this year. What wonderful timing, right before the pandemic hit. Uh, and basically, what, what, the, what the act does is say, okay, you've got chapter 11, but if you reorganize under this subchapter five, small business debtors have a whole different way of doing things. You know, if you're not a small business, then you do the regular chapter 11 reorganization. But if you are a small business, here, this chapter is for you. And the whole purpose was to make it easier for small business debtors to reorganize under chapter 11 um, and avoid some of the heavy expenses and the consumption of time that a chapter 11 reorganization normally takes. Um, how do you define a small business debtor? It's basically a business with total secured and unsecured debts of less than 2.7 million. The reason why it's a weird number, by the way, is that every three years, all the numbers and amounts in the bankruptcy code are required to be uh, adjusted for inflation. Uh, they, you know, all the amounts in the bankruptcy code are automatically adjusted by inflation. It was initially 2.5 million, uh, but over the years, it has increased to this god awful amount, which nobody can remember. Uh, the thing you need to know here is that the CARES Act, the Coronavirus uh, uh, Bailout Act that was passed earlier this year, increased this to 7.5 million, but with a one year um, uh, limit. So if you have a small business with more than 2.725, million, but less than 7.5 million, and you really want to avail yourself of subchapter five, you must do it prior to March 26th of next year, unless Congress renews it. They may renew it, they may, they may not. You have to file your petition sometime between now and then, if you are in that size range. If you're less than 2.7, well, then you can file anytime. Um, if you are an individual, if you are a sole proprietorship, not an LLC, but a sole proprietorship, you can also include your personal debt as long as it's less than 50% of the total amount. So if you owe $100,000 uh, to your business creditors and $90,000 of credit card debt, you can include all of that in a subchapter five filing and get some of your personal debts uh, discharged as well. The only businesses that are not eligible are businesses that are engaged primarily in real estate ownership. So if you have a house that you lease out and you put it in an LLC, subchapter five will not be uh, available for that type of business. But that's the only exception. Uh, any other small business can file. Uh, it's not like chapter 12 where you have to be a farmer or a uh, commercial fisherman. Okay, so let's start digging deep here. 
Only the beautiful part is only the small business debtor may file a plan. Your creditors cannot force you to reorganize in under subchapter five the way they can force you to reorganize in a regular uh, in a regular chapter eleven proceeding or a chapter seven. Um, you have to put together a plan. You submit the plan. Uh, the plan uh, must be filed within ninety days of the date that you file. Uh, and it must be accompanied by your uh, current balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, and your most recent federal uh, and state income tax returns. Okay, the plan must be fair and equitable, meaning it must be provide that all of the small business business debtors projected disposable income, and now that's a defined term, must be applied to pay your creditors over a period of three to five years. That's why that three to five year period I mentioned earlier is so important. Can you pay all your debts or most of them within a three to five year time frame? If the answer is yes, given a very conservative revenue projection over the next six to 12 months that we talk about, then subchapter five is right for you. Uh, what is disposable income? It means income that you receive that is not reasonably necessary to maintain and support you, satisfy domestic support obligations obligations or ensure the continuation, preservation, or operation of the business. It's basically your free cash flow. Whatever is not necessary to pay your essential debts and give you at least a reasonable sum to live on. Anything over that, your creditors get that for the next three to five years in a subchapter five plan. Uh, legal fees and other administrative claims can be paid over the life of the plan. This is a very good thing. If you cannot afford to pay a $10,000 retainer to a bankruptcy attorney, he or she may be willing to do a subchapter five because they get their legal fees as a priority claim over the next three to five years. Uh, under uh, regular chapter 11, they don't. They have to get it all paid up front or else they have to waive it, which is why it's so hard sometimes to get a bankruptcy attorney to uh, represent you without a huge upfront uh, retainer. Uh, Subchapter 5 makes it easier uh, for attorneys to work with you. It's, it's a very, I have to say, I'm becoming a fan of Subchapter 5. I think it does all of the right things to help small businesses reorganize in bankruptcy. I, I'm a fanboy. I, I will admit that. I, you know, if I was representing a client in this situation, I would push for Subchapter 5. Um, if the plan is fair and equitable and it doesn't fairly discriminate a class of creditors. Well, I'm not giving anything to Uncle Louie because I hate his guts. You know, you can't do stuff like that in the plan of reorganization. The court must approve the plan. You, what subchapter five does, you are in control under the subchapter five. Your creditors do not have the power that they have in a regular chapter 11 reorganization proceeding or a chapter seven liquidation. You are in control here. You control the plan. You control what happens, okay, in a subchapter five. So here's some of the powers you have under subchapter five. If you are a sole proprietor, you can modify the mortgage on your principal residence, but only if the mortgage was used as collateral for an SBA or other business loan. So for example, if you've ever done an SBA section seven loan, they always take a second mortgage on your house uh, as part of the collateral. That mortgage you can renegotiate uh, in a subchapter five bankruptcy, not your first mortgage. If the primary collateral uh, for the mortgage is your house, then you can't re uh, you can't renegotiate a first mortgage. This is a business reorganization, not a personal reorganization. You may be able to do that in chapter uh, 13. I don't know the answer to that offhand. I'm not a chapter 13 scholar, uh, but you can't do it under subchapter five. The owner of the small business that are, you can still retain your ownership stake in the, com in the company. In a chapter 11 reorganization, creditors will often be given an ownership stake in the company as part of the uh, reorganization plan. That doesn't happen in subchapter five. As long as the plan doesn't discriminate on fairly and it's fair and equitable, uh, you get to keep all your stock in the company and you continue to own it, although you probably won't be paying yourself any dividends for several years. Um, unless the court orders otherwise, you do not have a committee of creditors. In a regular chapter 11, your creditors form a committee and the committee can become very tyrannical. Uh, they can basically negotiate the plan with you. Uh, in chapter five, you don't have that. There is no committee 
um, you know, you submit your plan and the court gives it either a thumbs up or a thumbs down uh, within a certain time frame. Uh, it, it's designed to be an expedited bankruptcy proceeding that will get you out of bankruptcy within a period of 90 uh, to 180 days, sometimes six months. Uh, debts not covered by the plan are discharged. Uh, but the one thing you have to know, you can cram down some of your unsecured creditors here uh, and deny them any further payments. But if you do that, then the debts, those debts do not get discharged until the payment period is over. This is a big difference between a subchapter five and other ways of reorganizing in bankruptcy. If your plan provides for payment to all your creditors, so no one's getting crammed down, the discharge of, of, of any debts that are not part of the plan occurs immediately. But if you are cramming down one or more creditors, you have to wait until the uh, three to five year period is over before before the cram down takes place. Uh, if, you if you miss a payment, if you fail to make payments under the plan, if you default under the plan, those cram down creditors claims get revived and they come back at you, okay? So here's how a subchapter five works. You are, when you file a petition, you are appointed as what's called a debtor in possession, but the court does employ a high, a small business trustee to oversee the case and review your plan and recommend that the court either approve it or not approve it. The small business trustee is appointed by the court. Uh, they get, they pick these people from a list of US trustees. They are usually retired judges, retired bankruptcy lawyers, uh, retired CPAs. Uh, basically, you can apply. If you're a financial professional and you have interest in doing workout type work, uh, you can apply to the uh, federal court system to be uh, accepted as a U.S. trustee uh, and you would be appointed to various cases. There is no guarantee that the small business trustee will know anything at all about your business at all. It's all done at random by computers. So you may, if you're a, a you know, if you are a, a bar or a restaurant owner, you may get someone who comes out of the uh, entertainment industry or something like that, or something that's not really relevant or, or an industrial business who's not really understand your business. You may have to educate your trustee on some of the business realities you face, depending on who they appoint. Um, it's all done mechanically. Uh, you must file a plan within 90 days of, of, the, of your filing your petition. Uh, the good news is you don't have to include a disclosure statement, which is a, a requirement of chapter 11. Uh, it's basically a statement that show it's like a feasibility plan showing that you are able to meet the requirements of the plan over the next three to five years, given reasonable projections. You don't have to do that in subchapter five, but you must include a brief history of the business operations, a liquidation analysis, that's the balance sheet thing, um, and projections with respect to your ability to make payments under the proposed plan. That's part of a subchapter five filing in lieu of the formal disclosure uh, statement. An initial status conference with your creditors takes place within 60 days of filing. This is where you meet with your creditors uh, and, and the trustee. There's, there's, it's not a formal court thing. You meet with the trustee and basically your creditors, you know, they can nitpick your plan, they can make suggestions, but as long as it's fair and equitable and doesn't discriminate unfairly, they don't have a lot to say here. You don't have to follow their, their suggestions if you, or recommendations if you don't want to. Um, the only thing is though, at least four 14 days prior to the conference, you are required to file a report detailing your efforts to attain a consensual plan. You do have to, within that 60 days uh, after filing, you have to contact your creditors, explain the provisions of the plan. You got to make efforts to show that it's fair and equitable. If one creditor says, well, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in, but can you possibly, instead of forcing you to take a 10% haircut, can you pay 100%, but I'll give you two more years to, to pay the debt. You may have to agree to some modifications to your plan uh, in order to make that creditor happy so that he or she votes along, uh, votes to approve the plan. Um, you do not need to obtain the consent of an impaired class. You can cram them down. But if the plan calls for a cram down, two things happen. Number one, as we discussed earlier, you don't get a discharge of those cram down claims until uh, the plan has been fully paid out. And also uh, your newly acquired assets, things that you buy after you file for uh, your, your bankruptcy petition become property of the estate and they cannot be sold outside the ordinary course of business without the court's approval. So if you file a petition under subchapter five and 90 days later you acquire uh, an asset, you lease an office space or something like that, you cannot dispose of that asset without the court's approval. Um, so how does SCORE fit into this picture? SCORE counselors, I think, 
have a very important role to play in the subchapter five process. Since under subchapter five, you control the plan of organization and you've only got 90 days to file it, it makes sense to have the plan put together or at least started before you file for bankruptcy. And SCORE counselors can base and be very, very helpful here. A plan of reorganization is basically a business financial plan. It's very similar to what you would submit to the SBA for a section seven loan. And that is what SCORE people are trained to do is to help you in putting together those kinds of business plans. So why not take advantage of this? Um, you know, if you're thinking about doing a subchapter five, your SCORE counselor may be very helpful helpful in helping you put together the plan so that when you file your, your subchapter five petition with the court, you're already ready to go. The business plan is already put together. Uh, you can file it you know, well before the 90 day deadline. You can start sending it to your creditors. It will, it will expedite the process in a major way. And I don't have to say this, they're a lot cheaper than hiring a lawyer or an accountant to do that kind of work. Um, talk to your lawyer. Um, I mean, Subchapter 5, I am a fanboy of Subchapter 5. I think it's going to help a lot of small businesses uh, that have been adversely impacted by the uh, the coronavirus and the related uh, government shutdowns. But it is a court proceeding uh, supervised by a court, and a person cannot represent a business, even a business that you control, unless you are licensed to practice law in the federal courts. You cannot file a subchapter five petition without having an attorney of record. Uh, and that is, a, you can um, in state courts, you can represent yourself pro se, uh, but you cannot do that in federal bankruptcy court uh, for a business. You can file, if you are an individual creditor, a sole proprietorship, you might be able to do it. But if you have a corporation or LLC, even a single member LLC, you have to have a law, be licensed to practice law in order to represent that entity. Sorry about that. Um, the, also keep in mind that some federal bankruptcy courts have their own rules for things like, you know, there are certain debts that cannot be discharged, like alimony, uh, child support payments and stuff like that. But the rules differ from court to court. You need a lawyer who's familiar with all of the, we call them the local rules. Also, every state has different rules for designing exempt property. Uh, no two states have the same rules. To make things more complicated, the federal government has its own set of bankruptcy uh, exemptions, exemptions from uh, a bankruptcy estate, and they differ a lot from the state proceedings. You have to choose. You have to decide whether the state law exemptions or the federal law exemptions are better for you, and you need to have an attorney help you with that. California, for if we have any California people on this call, uh, your state is unique. You actually have two sets of state exemptions and a federal exemption on top of that. So you have three choices. If you're a California business, you have three uh, sets of exemptions to choose from. Nobody, including me, knows all of the little local variations on the federal uh, bankruptcy code. Okay, one more. So that's subchapter five. One more thing, and then we'll open the floor for questions. You know, what are the consequences of bankruptcy? Okay, um, even a subchapter five bankruptcy uh, will have consequences. Uh, bankruptcy filings remain on your credit report for 10 years. Um, your credit score will be shot, at least for a while. It will be. Uh, credit card companies, for some reason, will send you credit offers soon after you receive your discharge. Don't ask me why they do this, but they do. Uh, so you will be able to get a credit card again. Uh, purchasing a car on improved credit terms should be within reach within a year or two. I mean, you don't have to wait the full 10 years. You will be able to get back to a normal life within two to three years. Um, your chances of renting or leasing housing uh, will improve after about two years. Most people qualify for a mortgage within four years of bankruptcy, uh, possibly even sooner if a foreclosure wasn't involved and the bankruptcy was due to an unavoidable circumstance. Question, would, a convo would, uh, would the coronavirus um, uh, pandemic qualify as an unavoidable circumstance? That's a question we just don't know the answer to. So here are my takeaway points. Do everything you can to avoid bankruptcy. Uh, bankruptcy is a last resort. If you have only a few debts and they're owned by people that are willing to work with you, try working them out. Uh, the more creditors you have and the more crazier they are, the harder it's going to be to avoid a bankruptcy filing. If you have personally guaranteed any of your company's debts, 
try to pay those off first before filing bankruptcy for your company. If you, if you, have, if you owe $100,000, but only 10,000 of that is personally guaranteed, stay, try to do everything you can to stay in business for the next six months, pay everything to liquidate the $10,000 worth of personal bankruptcy, and then you can file uh, to liquidate your business under chapter seven for the rest of it, and your creditors won't be able to do anything to you. Get the, rid of the personally guaranteed debt first. Um, if your business has suffered due to the pandemic and related shutdowns, and you have so many creditors that workout discussions won't be feasible, talk to your lawyer about reorganizing under subchapter five. I, I would almost say that that's almost certainly the way your attorney is going to advise you to go. Uh, if you are a sole proprietor, though, or a husband-wife partnership, ask your lawyer whether it is better to reorganize under chapter 13 or the new subchapter five. Right now, my guess is subchapter five is preferable to a chapter 13 filing, but I'm not enough of a bankruptcy scholar to be able to answer that question. There may be circumstances under which your attorney may recommend that you file under chapter 13, mainly because the courts are more familiar with chapter 13 provisions. Chapter 13 has been around since 1994. They're just much more familiar with the rules. Uh, I understand that the key rules uh, under subchapter five have not been passed as yet. So lawyers who practice in the this area are sort of guessing as to what the court rules are going to be. It may be another couple of months before that. And an attorney may say, you know what, let's forget subchapter five, just go with chapter 13. It's 95% the same thing. Anyway, listen to what your attorney tells you. And then be sure to speak to a lawyer who specializes in bankruptcy and who's familiar with the local rules of the bankruptcy court where your business is located. One size does not fit all here. Uh, different courts have different rules and you need a local person who has practiced before that court before and who knows all the uh, the inside baseball. So that's it. Uh, these are some of my best selling books that uh, talk in some of these stories in the small business survival guide are about businesses who have dealt with bankruptcy situations. And then this is what I look like. Um, well, this is what I look like before the pandemic. Uh, right now, I look like the world's largest Brillo pad. Uh, I sort of look like some refugees from a disco circa 1976. Uh, I am really hoping that they uh, that they reinstate barbers and uh, hairstylists as soon as possible and declare them as essential businesses, because in my case, they are absolutely essential. They are in that pile number one of my triage pile of uh, people who get paid on time. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Elliot. I'm sure we'll have some questions. I will do the best I can to uh, answer these questions with the understanding that I myself am not a bankruptcy expert. Uh, some of the more technical questions, I may have to defer to a, a real bankruptcy expert and point you in that direction. So Elliot. Actually, uh, Cliff, it's, it's Bob. Um, I'm going to be doing it. And uh, thank you very much for covering a lot of material um, in, a, in a great uh, format. There was a lot there. Um, if people have questions, just a reminder, uh, please submit them by the chat feature. If you're looking to, for the chat feature, you can hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and you'll likely see it come up. And if it's not there, you could try the top and you click on that and you can submit your questions. We do have a couple here to start with. Um, Cliff, the, um, the, the first one really has, has to do here with uh, personal um, guarantees. And so yeah. uh, where can you find out if a debt is personally guaranteed? And you can, can you explain that in more detail and then talk about the release option? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Basically, first of all, you need to keep, this is why the attorneys are pack rats. We keep copies of everything. Um, you want it, whenever you sign on for a debt, keep a copy of the credit card agreement that comes with it. Usually don't throw that away. Keep it in a file somewhere. Most of us just discard it, but there's important stuff in there. Um, and one of the things is, is your debt personally guaranteed? But, a real, but, a, but an easy way to check, look at your credit card itself. If your credit card has both your business name and your individual name, on it, you have personally guaranteed that debt. That's that that is that, that's a given that you have to do. Um, you know, in a lease or other you know written contract, look at the way the document was signed. In a lease, there usually will be a separate document called a personal guarantee. And if there is no personal guarantee, if the lease is signed by whatever LLC or whatever Inc., then you have not personally guaranteed that debt. But be very careful. A lot of landlords play games here. They say 
say in the in the beginning of the agreement, this lease is between whatever as landlord and whatever LLC is tenant. But then when you go down to the signature lines, the LLC name is not there. The LLC, the, the, the signature for the tenant is your individual signature. And the notary form says, before me personally came to Joe Blow who signed this document. If that's the way you signed the lease, you may have signed the lease in your individual capacity. Whenever I do a lease for a client, one of the first things I do is look at the signature lines and make sure that the lease is being signed by the LLC or corporation as tenant, not by my client individually. It's one of the first things I look at. Um, is a release agreement an option with credit card companies? Let's put it this way. There's no harm in asking here, um, especially if you are terminating the card and especially if it looks like you're going into bankruptcy shortly. Um, some credit card companies may be willing to accept a reduction in your debt. What they will not do is allow you to continue borrowing up to your maximum limit until such time as the uh, debt is paid off. You usually can renegotiate payment schedules though with credit card companies and pay hey, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, going on to the next question, um, what is better between negotiating a payment plan with each credit card versus subchapter five? My answer is it depends on how many there are. If you've got only one or two credit cards, then maybe an out of court negotiation will work better. If you've got 15 credit cards that are all maxed out and there's no way you're going to be able to pay these in the next three to five years, then you're probably looking at a bankruptcy filing. Um, Okay, we have a, a question. So, okay, go uh, ahead, Cliff, Bob. The next, yeah, the next one is from one of our score counselors, but I think the situation may apply to a broader audience. So I'll just, I'll just read it to you. It's a fairly lengthy situation, but maybe you can have a, a couple minutes left to comment on. It. And uh, this counselor has has a client with about forty five thousand in personal credit cards and a thirty thousand dollar car loan plus forty thousand in business debt that is personally guaranteed. The business debt is being paid by the SBA for the next six months per the CARES Act, but the client cannot afford to pay the credit cards and the car loan because the business is currently closed as a result of COVID-19. They don't have any income. Um, if the creditors won't negotiate on the credit cards and the car loan, can subchapter five be used in this case or should the client file for personal bankruptcy? Okay, this is a tough one. Okay, this is a situation in which there's lots of debt owed to a lot of different people. Um, what I don't know is whether a bankruptcy filing at this point would cut off the SBA payments for the next six months. Uh, this means that the SBA is making the payments. To, uh, this business obviously has employees because you have to use a CARES Act. The proceeds of a CARES Act loan must be used to pay payroll expenses. Uh, and those payments are forgiven to the extent that they are used for payroll expenses. If you file for bankruptcy within the next six months, that may cut off the SBA's forgiveness of those payments. And I apologize, I do not know the answer to that question. But let's assume that the answer to that is yes. What I would do here is hang out there for the next six months while the business debt is being paid by the SBA. And then once that has been done, then you, know, you may have to file under either subchapter five or more likely a, a chapter seven uh, liquidation here. Um, it's a tough call here. I would simply, this is a question where I would ask the client, you know, do the emotional self-assessment too. Are you willing to spend the next three to five years of your life working for your creditors? You know, basically, which is what happens when you reorganize under subchapter five, all your disposable income is going to go into your creditors pockets. How do you feel about working for them for the next three to five years? If the answer is you just don't, the thought, you know, makes you gag then you're looking at more of a liquidation uh, scenario here. And because there is credit card debt, those debts are personally guaranteed. The car loan probably is personally guaranteed as well. Um, you're probably going to be looking at a personal bankruptcy as well, um, unavoidably. If, you know, a big question is when is he going to be allowed to reopen? Um, if, if there's a possibility of the business reopening within the next, you know, six months, then you might want to hang out there and see what happens because once you start being getting revenue again, you have more, more, more money to play with here, and you a subchapter five filing may make more sense at that point because there is revenue coming in. If six months down the road there's still zero income, then I think you're you're automatically looking at a liquidation scenario here. Now that's off the top of my head. Uh, I would definitely talk to an attorney who is a a bankruptcy uh, specialist, and if that score counselor will send me an email 
uh, after this program is over. You got my email address right there. I'll, I'll give you uh, two names that I, that I really respect in this area. All right, thanks, Cliff. Unfortunately, um, that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, as a reminder, the um, webinar was recorded and the materials will be available in about 48 hours on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org. Uh, just a reminder, our next live webinar is this Thursday, May 26th, or sorry, May 28th at 8 a.m. And the topic is balancing the technology of work and homeschooling and with Bud Freund presenting uh, that webinar. Again, uh, if you could move the slide uh, there, uh, Cliff, um, we offer free individual counseling. So if you would like that one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling, uh, please uh, visit our website and request uh, a mentor. By that way, you can also um, click on the link we showed you earlier. And uh, we'd really appreciate if you could fill out your evaluations that will be sent at the end of this. So on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending our live webinar today. And a big thank you uh, to Cliff for covering a very complex and important topic for us today. And stay well, everyone, and have a great day.